So this morning I have nine things to ask of you, to recommend for you, to support you in building the bridge to a new life. These are not things simply to think about once in a while, but really to adopt or to put into motion. Maybe not all at once, but certainly at some point they all have to become in motion. <clears throat> These are things for you to see within your own life how you're going to practice this. You know, when I meet people of different faith traditions, if I have an opportunity to speak with them, <clears throat> I always want to find out what they practice, not what they believe. I don't care what they believe, really. It, it's important in the sense that it determines their behavior and their perception to a large extent, but I really want to know what they practice. Because that's where the rubber meets the road. That's what really matters. It's what people do, not what they think about doing. So, the first thing I ask of you is to be really open to what happens next. Being open means that you are suspending judgment, expectation, apprehension, be open to what happens next. Not next, the next big thing in your life, but the next thing you're doing. You know, most mistakes are made because people aren't paying attention. People are not aware of where they are and what they're doing. Their mind is not on where they are and what they're doing. Their mind is somewhere else. And they may not even know where their mind is, but it's not there. Many of the great practices in the New Message are there to teach us how to be really present. To know what we're doing so eventually we can do what we know. To know what we're doing. What am I doing right now? Getting ready to come here this morning, I probably had to follow 20 different steps from where I was when I woke up to being here now. Maybe 30 steps, okay? But how often do you not calculate those steps and have to repeat them because they're out of sequence? Oops, I forgot that. Oops, I forgot this. Oops, I didn't do that because your mind is not on what you're doing, really, sufficiently. Did anyone have this experience? Can't just be just me. <laughs> That's good. I'm relieved. <clears throat> Everything you do, everywhere you are, is an opportunity to practice being there. Don't have to think of it as a spiritual practice. It's just being able to be engaged with what's happening. Purpose of spiritual study and practice is not to take you out of reality, is to teach you how to be in reality with a greater strength and power. So much spiritual teaching out there just takes people away and, <clears throat> to, and stimulates their fantasies about themselves and the world. Make them ever more incapable of being in reality. 
ever less functional, responsive, courageous, effective. The new message, uh, we think of it as functional spirituality because it's totally geared to, to bring you back or to bring you here with the strength of knowledge and with whatever wisdom you have gained to serve you. To serve the world, which is the purpose of all this. You can't be afraid or in avoidance or hiding out or trying to live some kind of alternative reality or create your own reality. This is just another version of being separate. I have my own reality. I've heard it said recently that we're living in an era of uh, post-truth. I find that very curious. Where everyone's in their own reality and there is no real truth. It's all about perception and I'm in my reality, this is my truth, and you're in your reality, it's true. So, what is reality then? I say, this is my current definition of reality, reality is everything that's happening beyond your thoughts and beliefs. Your thoughts and beliefs are merely in interpretive. They either help you see or they hinder you from seeing. They either engage you with reality or they disengage you. This is very important to understand <clears throat> because the great practices, inner listening, stillness, looking without judgment, <clears throat> learning how to direct your mind at will, always knowing where your mind is going, Objectively questioning your assumptions and beliefs. Stepping back from who you think you are and what you think life is. Is all to re-engage you with reality. Hmm. I mean, better to, instead of creating your own reality, find out the reality that created you, that lives within you at this moment. And this has brought you into the world and seeks to engage you in the world in a very specific way according to your nature and design and according to a greater coordination which is entirely beyond our understanding. With certain people, places, situations. I mean, if you can't engage with reality, then you can't be guided. You ever seen in a moving river how along the edges, parts of the river will get caught in an eddy, what's called an eddy, a swirl, where the water just goes around and it just circulates? <clears throat> Let's say this river is your life and you want to move with it but you get caught in an eddy of confusion or delusion or frustration or pain or, and you can't move. Or you're trapped by your circumstances, by the expectations of others, and certainly beyond that, poverty and degradation, which is really a serious matter. Or you're moving. <laughs> My life is moving but you're like this. You're not going with where your life is meant to go. And this is, this is the state of probably most people in the world today. Either circumstantially or just because they, they haven't really made an engagement with life yet. It calls something out of them that's bigger than their ideas. So we've all been shaped by culture, 
family, friends, and by our own, our own ideas and assumptions as a consequence. And this creates a very confining state of consciousness. And from that, we look out and we try to understand the world. We're in our little blockhouse, right? Because the mind is like you know, cement. Even though cement has to be mixed constantly <clears throat> to be viscous and usable. But if it's let to sit, it dries and you can't do anything with it. The mind is kind of like this. If it isn't being stirred and activated, rehabilitated, regenerated, it becomes hardened and self-defensive. And you kind of go out of communication with your source. <clears throat> now you become afraid of knowledge. Now you become afraid of freedom. Now you become afraid of the mystery because your whole life is set upon a certain set of notions or ideas. So when we practice in being present, we practice listening, um, both inside and outside, as we're able to do that. Just like I'm listening to myself while I'm watching you. I'm listening to what I say while I speak to you. And that way I don't say things I don't mean to say. I don't say things that shouldn't be said. Um, I don't misrepresent myself. <laughs> so we're in the process now of learning skills. And I'm much more interested in <clears throat> this because Without these skills, uh, you just will not be able to do the things that the message is asking you to do. You know, when we practice inner listening, it's not to get things. An answer, I need an answer. Or to have an insight. I had an insight. I don't think insights are worth very much, actually, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, We practice the great practices to develop skills, to re-employ the mind, to build, develop new neural pathways of how the mind is going to function, a new way of responding to other people, responding to conflict, responding to beauty, responding to degradation. We're building skills to be able to be in the world in a new way. And we're doing this in such a way that we become immortal beings in the world to be of service rather than being in the world with some vague notion of our own that we have a greater life somewhere, somehow, above and beyond this existence. Instead of being trapped by the world, we're being fed by heaven. So our practice now is skill building, and I want you to really think about that. <clears throat> this is not a reward system where every time you practice, you get a reward. Every time you do a trick, you get a cookie. Good boy. No, we're practicing to become strong and competent. There's no emphasis on mastery here. The emphasis on competence. Functionality. In fact, the new message says there are no masters living in the world. The mastery is beyond anything that can be achieved here. So let's take that out of the picture. Anyone who claims to be a master or appears to be a master is still a student in the world.
So many things have to be taken out of the picture for the way to become clear, you see. Things that people fixate upon or, or think are very, very important. Have to be relieved because we're losing energy to all these things. You know? It's like the vessel has all kinds of little leaks in it. They've got to be plugged up or it can't hold anything. So that's why <clears throat> the journey, much of the journey, is about undoing, about creating openness, space, freeing up energy, and allowing your mind to be reshaped and guided by knowledge. Otherwise, your mind is like a block of cement, and you can't do anything with it. Yeah. So we do the three stages of knowing. Said very simply, and this is an oversimplification, but there are three stages of knowing. One is recognizing the sign or the impulse. The sign may be on the outside, the impulse may be on the inside. You recognize something that stands, really stands out. It's not ordinary, it's not your usual kind of thing to recognize. Many people experience this. They have moments of recognition, but they don't go any further with it. Next is to contemplate the sign or impulse unless action is required in the moment. Your car's going off the road, as we just recently had in this huge storm in Colorado. People's cars went off the road. Oh, my car's going off the road. I can't stop and contemplate this. I've got to go into action immediately. Um, and the third is acting upon the sign of the impulse, which may be something that's needed very shortly uh, or immediately, if it's not immediately, shortly, or subsequently. We have this beautiful quote by Wang Yang Min, who was a uh, early 16th century teacher of the way of knowledge. There is no knowledge which does not lead to action. If one knows but does not act, then one really does not know. So until we take this thing that you have recognized and have been contemplating uh, to action, then it's not yet really knowledge. Because it's what you do in the end that really matters. I say three things. is what you do, is what you serve, and why you serve. In the end are the three things that really matter. Awareness that does not lead to action is still circulating in your mind. It has not come into reality yet to be effect fully effective there. Contemplating means you're really being with something, not just for a moment or a day, but you are going to keep put this up on your mirror and you're going to look at it every day. <laughs> you're going to walk around this mountain because you don't know what it is yet. And it's important that you not assume you know what it is. Oh, I have this, I got this message and it's, I know what this is. No, you don't. A message is just a doorway. It's not, <laughs> it's not what's down the hall. It's just the doorway. You have to go down that hall. This is a reemployment of the mind. This is what people don't do. Unless you're a scientist working on a, an important project or an engineer working on a plan. I mean, most people don't go, don't go very far with their own experience. <clears throat> Knowledge works through your experience. 
It can work through ideas, but the ideas have to generate experience. A beautiful idea, what's that worth if it doesn't generate real experience, which then generates real action in the world? A change of heart, doing something you've never done before, shifting gears in how you respond to somebody from the way you used to respond to people like that. The next is um, to determine what part of your life you're not yet willing to have directed by knowledge. At any given moment, you have limits and boundaries as to what you're willing to gamble or to bring into this light. And that's okay, but I want you to be honest about it. Instead of pretending that you're really open, I'm always being guided. No, you're not. I'm really open. No, you're not. to be really honest about the range of your life that you're willing to, be, to be have to be reshaped by knowledge. Really going to be open about that and know what areas you say, well, I don't think I can go there quite yet. Eventually you're going to have to go there if you want to be free. But knowing your limits here is very important. Then you won't pretend that you're really more open than you are, and it'll give you a lot of pause, and it will also maybe tell you why knowledge has not been responding to your question. I can't get, I've been asking this question, I can't get anything. Well, Why would knowledge give you a directive that you're not going to take? Even if you knew you needed to take it but were not able, that would just create more confusion and crisis for you. So, know your limits. Next, follow those things you already know to do. Listen to yourself talk. Listen to what you say to yourself. Oh, I know I need to do this. I know I need to do that. But you're not doing it. So why would anything new be given to you if you're not already doing what you know to do? Already, you have lots of work to do. The new message is full of directives and everything. I mean... You couldn't do it all, possibly, but at any given moment, you have a lot of work to do, in, both on the inside and the outside. There shouldn't be any wondering what to do. Look at your physical condition. Look at your mental condition. Look at how and where you live. Look at the state of your relationships. And then there's all the particulars of life that need to be managed or maintained. So <clears throat> at any given moment, you've got lots to do. And if you're sitting around wondering what to do, you are not present. And if you're not doing those things, then you can ask for the moon, but, you know, It's like asking for the moon. We're given the idea of the four pillars of life, the pillar of relationships, the pillar of work and providership, the pillar of health, and the pillar of spiritual development. All to be built, all to be sustained, because your life is only as stable as the weakest pillar in your life. And the beauty of that whole balance, that four pillars, like the four legs of a table, is that is the antidote to eccentricity and self-obsession. 
at any given moment, one pillar is going to require more effort than the others. But they all have to be maintained. And this takes a lot of work. And this engages your mind. And this keeps you stable in the world. Steps to knowledge begins with the step, knowledge is with me, where am I? So incredible. That's the problem. And the rest of the steps to knowledge is about solving that problem. You should never be waiting for guidance if you're doing what you know to be doing. The next thing will come to you when you are ready. When you've completed these set of tasks or brought these things in order, something else will come to you to, to do or to undo or to change or to repair or to resolve. There's no waiting for guidance. That's, And the things you know you need to do, some of them are not easy. It's going to take some time. You're going to have to get to work and sustain something. <clears throat> the next is regarding the things that are really important Time is of the essence. It is really important. In fact, the new message says that time is nothing to God but everything to you. The time that you have, the time you've been given. How that time is being spent and utilized. And the cost of time is just tremendous. In fact, I'd like you with me to this, this moment, to stop and think about the lost time in your life. And don't reassure yourself, say, well, was, everything was for a purpose and everything happened as it should. No. Damn, you have wasted time. Let's be honest. You were caught in those eddies for a long time until something forced you out of them. <clears throat> So just take a moment and think about lost time in your life. And, and do this compassionately, but honestly. Well, I'll let you continue that on your own, um, but it's really important because this is part of what motivates you to be unwilling to waste time. I mean, certain relaxation and being carefree and times for that, certainly. But is your life really engaged? Or are you falling behind, losing connections? Remember, life is about what you do, what you serve, and why you serve. It's not about having realizations and weaving fantasies around them. You know, the new message is here to wake us up, not give us a better dream. You know, if you're doing what you need to be doing now, you will make this journey. You'll go on to the next thing, 
You will do, you will do whatever that requires. You'll go on to the next thing. You'll do whatever that requires. You'll make the journey. And as you do so, you'll be increasingly unwilling to waste time. Like one of the practices uh, I mentioned above um, is knowing where your mind is going. You won't be able to do that all the time, but you start by knowing where your mind is going as much as you can remember it. Because that's time. And if you don't know where your mind is going, then, and I, certainly, you know, where's my mind been for the last four hours? I don't know. I went to work. I did these things. But you don't know where your mind is going. Mindfulness. And it's not just to watch your mind, it's to direct your mind or to redirect your mind. Otherwise, you're going wherever it's going, instead of the other way around. If, you know, the mind is the perfect servant, but if it has nothing to serve, it serves itself. Or it serves false gods, or it serves other people, or it serves whatever it can think of to serve, because it only knows how to serve. It may even think it's the master. <laughs> It doesn't know what to serve. So the next thing I ask of you is are you ready to take the next step? Given all that I've said so far, are you ready to take the next step? You don't know what the next step is, by the way. So being ready is being ready to take it whatever it is. Not like, oh, well, I'll tell me what it is and I'll think about whether I'm ready. No. No, I'm going to put the horse in front of the cart now, okay? So are you ready to take the next step? It's a strong yes, a weak yes, I don't know, a strong no or a weak no. That's the range of your choices. Or you can say, I don't want to deal with this. You could, that's, I can add that to the range. I'm too busy. This isn't just a decision you make, it's, an, it's a position you take. When you realize how hopeless your own management of your life has been, uh, you will want to be open to the next step. If the next step is the only thing you can really do in this journey, you can't rush ahead and be trying to contemplate, you know, where you should be, or where you may be, or how it may turn out, then are you ready to take the next step? And the truth is you can only take the next step. Which is why I don't, I don't take people's questions very much anymore because there are so many often it's about things that are not their next step. Um, it's not functional, it's not helpful. Maybe you already know your next step and you're not sure you want to take it. Or you really don't know. But that's fine. It's fine if you don't know. It's just, are you open to knowing? Do you need to know? See, knowledge arises according to need. I want you to really get this. So the less you are engaged with your real needs, the less you have that's going to propel a response from knowledge. <clears throat> so 
See, knowledge and action are very, very connected here. So, and knowledge is rises in proportion to need. Otherwise, you know, it's just a wish. Will I ever find someone who will love me? That's not a need. That's a wish. It has nothing to do with whether you're ready for such a relationship. <laughs> or if even you're even a, a worthy candidate. Or if you, your life is too broken down to um, even participate in something like that. That's another story. But the, thing, the question is, are you ready to take the next step? Because you can only take the next step. Meanwhile, knowledge is working around the clock while you sleep, while you eat, while you're intoxicated, wherever you are, it's working slowly reshaping you. But it can only do so, uh, it can only activate all that with your participation. So regarding readiness, do not take too much time to do what is before you now to do. There is a pace that is required. It is not too fast or too slow, but it's probably not a pace you may be comfortable with because you're not used to it. It's not too hard, you're just not used to it. You're not used to being that alert, that clear, that determined. Even little things will require, well, you'll lose energy to them if they're not resolved. You want to get the little things done so you're available to the bigger things. or even the intermediate things. Do not take too much time to do what you know you must do. Time, again, huge emphasis here. To the person's languishing, time is like whatever. To the per person who's on a mission, time is essential. You were meant to be here on a mission, not to languish in time. You've already languished in time. Now I'm going to ask you to do something a little different, to consider something different. This is for the protection, your protection, but also the protection of the new message and this whole community, okay? And that is to beware of the ambitious person who thinks they know what this is and who seeks to take advantage of being here. Such a person, well, people like this have already come through here. Uh, such a person will definitely be coming here as this grows in power and recognition. <laughs> I've met so many of these people in my life, it's amazing. Oh yes, I've studied metaphysics for 20 years. I've worked with the masters. I mean, I'm, I'm at the third level, whatever that is. I meditate, you know, hours every day. I'm, steps to knowledge, yeah, this is, this is nothing. What is this? This is a warning given to me, given to all who work with me, but also I want to give this to you because it will help safeguard your life and will safeguard this mission. And included here is to be aware of your own tendencies 
to give your power and authority away to people who seem more determined, more certain than you are. To let them just kind of take over, lead me. This is a, this is a dangerous thing. And there are many people who will want to take that role and who do take that role. And they can gather many followers. But these people are not being empowered by doing that. My intention is to keep you in the driver's seat, not to put you on the bus. God's in the back seat, but you got to be in the driver's seat. Which means you have to become competent, careful, responsible, courageous. I mean, you have to, all these qualities, they go along with living a new life reality, have to come into play here. Or you just don't want to take the helm of your own life. Just give it over. He'll take me there. Jesus will take me there. This teacher will take me there. Here the student, even the student, becomes kind of a self-appointed guide to others. And maybe they, they're not they, maybe they're not even ambitious. They just, just kind of assume a, a leadership role around others who just would love to have them lead them or who seem more uncertain than they are. But I would rather have people be uncertain than to be guided by somebody else in this way. Everybody here has to get themselves up this mountain. I can fill your backpack with useful things, but you have to get yourself up this mountain. I even think having meetings like this, which are very important, should be very infrequent. Because what really matters is where you go with yourself in your own time of study and practice. That's where the real work is happening. If we met every week, it'd be kind of a group thing. It would be a group energy and a group moment, momentum, and we'd all be moving together with the group, and it's like, no. That goes on. There's a lot of that going on out there. People are not getting stronger in that environment. They're not following what they really need to be following. It's, you know, it's... If you're really broken down, a group can be helpful at the beginning, but you really have to set out on your own when you're able. And everyone here is able to do that. Or you wouldn't have come this far. You wouldn't be part of the new message. You all with me? Okay, good. These, this is all part, this all goes together. So. The last thing I want to ask of you is to be is to ask knowledge or pray for knowledge to show you what you need to be aware of out in the world. There are lots of things to be aware of out in the world, and you don't want to be aware of them all because the world will consume you. You'll be the dumbfounded viewer watching a big movie. But there are certain things that may come to you that you really kind of need to not just look at once in a while, but really kind of keep track of. Because they have something to do with you. 
some contribution you may make in the future, which isn't really clear at this moment. The new message prepares you for a role, but doesn't tell you what it is. Because if it told you what it is, you'd either run away, or you would think, oh, I can do that. And you would make, all, make it up for yourself, when in fact, that wouldn't be the thing to do at all. It prepares you for something that, to be revealed later. Welcome to the way of knowledge. <laughs> I've been given a list of things I have to keep track of, but that's just my list. It's not your list. And I keep track of them. And that way, in terms of looking at the world, I kind of know where my, my focus should be, rather than on anything and everything that's sensational or tragic or you know, fantastic or horrific or beautiful or whatever. You just, you just become overwhelmed. These are the things I, I need you to do for you, for all of us, because you're not only working for yourself now, for those who sent you into the world, who are counting on you to make progress here, so thankful that you've finally made your rendezvous. But once the rendezvous is made, you have to set out on this journey, a journey not of your own making. And some things you have to understand before you do. like changing the plumbing in your house or anything else of that nature. Uh, but many other things, the more essential things you have to do and then understand. So they're both valid. They just have their own realms of application. Um, when fixing something, you. It's good to understand or, fun gets, or learn how or get the understanding from somewhere before you attempt something like that. But fixing your life, well, it's more the other way around. It's doing and then understanding. Or not doing and then understanding. So I'm going to leave you with these nine things. I've given this to you not only for all of you who are gathered with me this morning, but for all who will hear this in the future, for all who may find this in distant times to come. It's part of the record of my teaching. This is relevant to people who are on this journey or a journey similar to this. So, instead of understand only, do and then understand. That is how you will learn. Okay, the blessing is with you. The presence is with you. We're not alone. I'll see you over our crown. <laughs>